case you haven't recognized him yet, I am not Eddie Sanders. I don't look nearly as good as that guy. All right, so Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 is where we will be uh, this evening. You know, one of the more unique experiences that I've had the privilege to um, partake in is the light bulb that clicks uh, when you recognize who somebody is. Uh, in June 2011, it was my last, quote, uh, time with the Marine Corps, and we were doing Fleet Week in St. Louis. And that week, the St. Louis Cardinals were playing the Philadelphia Phillies. And as we landed and as we got our sea bags, we rushed out of the terminal into a van and we started to pack our stuff in. And I look over to my left. And out of the car comes a gentleman who's about 6'4", 250, and he looked really familiar. And it, he looked like a famous Phillies player. And so I walked up to the gentleman and I said, Sir, are you Ryan Howard? He said, Yes, I am. And it's interesting because I walked up calmly, but then as soon as the light bulb clicked, I had to get an autograph. I said, sir, I'm a sergeant of the Marine Corps. Would you mind signing my... I didn't know what... To, I didn't have a program. I didn't have a baseball. I didn't have a Phillies hat. So I went to the next thing that I possessed. Like, will you sign my Marine Corps hoodie, please? <laughs> and so I looked and I looked and I looked. And finally, I got a, a, a pin. And he traced over his uh, signature uh, multiple times until it finally was readable and seeable. And I was like... Hallelujah! I mean, I've been in St. Louis for two minutes and already I've got a famous MLB player's autograph. And so that was one of the times where, hey, once you realize who somebody is, the excitement fills your veins and euphoria hits and you got to get the autograph. The other time, and I don't know, uh, one, it's one of the multiple times that I've flown from Denver to Virginia while I was at Bear Valley, we were getting on the terminal to go to Terminal B because DIA is a huge airport. And I'm sitting there on the train rail, on the train car, and, and I look over to my right as the train is making a turn, and I look at it and I say, I've seen this guy before. He's been in a documentary. He's done Clearasell um, commercials. You know, he was an economist, a uh, famous economist as well. I was like, who is that? Finally clicked. That's Ben Stein. Ben Stein, clear eyes for dry eyes, right? That guy. And so I, I couldn't get to because there's so many people, but we had a look like nobody else knew who that was except for me. And he kind of gave me a smile and a nod, and I walked up to him afterwards and said, Sir, appreciate your work on your recent documentary, Expelled. He goes, Thank you very much. I hope you buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Ben Stein stuff. And so we all have those moments, whether it's, you know, when we see family, when we see friends that we haven't seen in a long time, or maybe we're just in random spots across the country and we meet somebody who we haven't seen since high school. And once it becomes crystal clear exactly who they are, we understand that, man, I have a relationship with that person, or I know that person, and I want to go up and talk, speak, and interact with them. And so here in Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 8 is what I call a light bulb moment. Light bulb moment for a group of people who are with this teacher that is in the process of not just shaping his culture, not just shaping his time, but all time, forever. And so we see this moment in Mark chapter 8, at the end of the chapter, but really what leads up to this moment is just as valuable and just as important to the end of the chapter as is the beginning of the chapter. And notice what it says in, John, or in Mark chapter 8. In those days, again, when a great crowd had gathered, they had nothing to eat. And he, Jesus, called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. And so the question we want to ask tonight is, what should the reaction be? 
when people finally come into contact with Jesus or with people who proclaim to be Jesus' people. And notice what it says there. It says there, And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. So in order to understand the importance of Jesus, we also have to understand the character of Jesus. To understand, to get to that light bulb moment, we have to understand the nature of who Jesus is. Notice, he had gathered many people to him, and they had been with him for multiple days, and he saw the need of the people, and he desired to meet their need. And so when people come to Jesus and understand who Jesus is, they will understand that Jesus can provide for them something that they cannot provide for themselves. And that's the same reaction they should have when they, when they encounter people who claim to be, to be Jesus's. Now notice the lesson that Jesus wants to teach to these people. And if I send them away, they'll go to their homes and they will faint. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? See, previously when Jesus fed the 5,000, he used food from the crowd's uh, possessions. But it seems here as though the crowd has nothing or else they'd be doing what? They'd be eating. And so the disciples ask, where in the world are we going to get bread from? It seems that in the feeding of 5,000, the light bulb didn't quite click as to who this Jesus guy was. Because it was in that same scenario where he had compassion on the crowd and used the crowd's possessions to feed, to feed them. And he asked them, notice this question that he asked. How many woes do you have? See, Jesus is not one who just uh, requires the disciples to sit back and watch him work. He is one who requires his own disciples to give of themselves as well. For, if, for to be a follower of Jesus means to give of <laughs> Yourself. That is Jesus' nature as we see constantly throughout the Gospels. He is one who both meets the physical needs of people by his nature because he has compassion and love for people, but also meets the spiritual needs of people because of his compassion and his mercy and his love. And so it's here in Mark chapter 8, in moving to this light bulb moment where Jesus asks his people, what do you have to offer the world? What do you have to offer this crowd? And notice what they said. How many loaves do you have? Seven. Now, what must have been going through the disciples' mind, do you think? I mean, it's speculation, but what might have been going through their mind when Jesus asked that question? Well, if we give our seven away, what are we going to eat as a group? I mean, surely we've been out here with these people for three days too. And if we give up the seven, guess the seven loaves, guess what? It's not going to be nearly enough to feed this crowd, but it's not going to be nearly enough to feed us. And if we can't be fed and Jesus can't be fed, how can he continue his ministry? See, sometimes we get in situations where... The lack of our physical abilities or possessions automatically means that God can't do work. Sometimes that's our thought process. But isn't it interesting that throughout the Bible, from the Old Testament, even into the New Testament, God takes the small and makes it great. God takes the disadvantage and works it to His advantage. God takes the remnant and accomplishes multiple things. And they'd already seen that. 
by Bible chapters just a chapter and a half before. And what Jesus constantly tells us and shows us in the Gospel, specifically the Gospel of Mark, is that he is not one who takes strength in order to produce strength. He is one that takes weakness and makes strength out of it so that the people who are on the receiving end of that blessing can have a light bulb moment. And notice, and he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. This means in directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, means that they were not just going to have scraps, that they were about to sit down on the ground for a while and have a feast. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate until they were satisfied. See, when we look at Jesus as the bread of life, when we look at Jesus as the sustainer, when we have that light bulb moment and we come to grips, with who Jesus is and the purpose of his ministry and the meaning behind a relationship with him, we will be satisfied. We live in a world, and this is something that we talked about a lot at camp. We live in a world where so many people are okay, but also struggle in being defined by the things of the world. So many people, whether that's from uh, middle school, high school, college, or professional. They are defined by how many trophies they gather unto themselves. There's so many people who are defined and their life's goal and the mission of their life is to make sure that they are absolutely positively well off. And there's so many people who are defined by whether or not Sally Sue or Johnny will take them to prom or date them or so many people are defined, define their life by whether or not they get married. So many people are defined in their life by how strong they are, or what their physique looks like, or how much fame they can accumulate to themselves, or how much money they can have in the bank. Yet Jesus says, if you have me, you have all that you need. And Sometimes we stop there. And all that you can ever want. Amen. And what's so freeing about that is that if Jesus is all I could ever need and Jesus is all that I could ever want, then that means I am free from the criticisms of people. I am free from being defined by what is defined in the world as success fame, popularity, or commonly known as making it. If I'm with Jesus, I've already got it. Amen. But in order to get there, I have to have that light bulb moment. And notice what he says. They ate till they were satisfied, and they took up broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with the disciples. And it says in verse 11, now, here's the interesting thing. The disciples haven't arrived yet at this light bulb moment. But the Pharisees are starting to catch on to who this Jesus guy might be. And, who this Je and what this Jesus guy might threaten. And so it says there in verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Isn't that a unique question that Jesus asks? Tell me, why do you come to me? And that's a unique 
question that we might want to ask ourselves as well. Why do we come to Jesus? Is it simply because we feel that we are absolutely obligated? Is it out of the sense of love and care and need for Jesus? Or is it of a I got to mentality? Is Jesus only Savior as long as I have all of the possessions that I could ever want? Is Jesus only Savior as long as He forgives me of my sin, but does not demand that I seek after holiness? Is Jesus only Savior and not Lord? It's almost as these Pharisees are. They come to demand a sign, not because they could ever be convinced by the sign, but because they want to seek to trap Jesus. In John 9, the Jews again come to him and the Pharisees come to him and they ask for a sign after the feeding of the 5,000. He says, you're not here because you saw a sign and a miracle. You're here because you want your stomachs full. And he says, truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Not that Jesus didn't do more signs and wonders, but he's saying that even if I did the sign, no matter how many signs, you'll never have that light bulb moment. You'll never see me for who I truly am. And what a heartbreak that is, that there are so many people in this world that no matter how much evidence we put their way, no matter how many times we pray for them, no matter how many times they read this book, they will never have the light bulb moment. Not because they can't. Because they won't. And this is what happens when people don't come to that realization. He left them, got to the boat, and went to the other side. It should be understood that Jesus will not force anybody into his kingdom. Jesus will not force anybody into his presence. And on the day of judgment, God will not force anybody into heaven. He will give people as they have chosen to take. That those who would seek to have Jesus as their Savior will have chosen heaven, will have chosen the bread of life, will have chosen access to the tree of life. And those who have not have chosen eternal punishment. And then Jesus uses this situation and he uses this encounter with the Pharisees to try and teach a lesson to his own disciples. And he says, now they had forgotten to bring the bread and they only had one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to him, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? See, they had missed the illustration. The illustration wasn't, How much food do we have left? The illustration was, Notice that only a little bit of leaven destroys all of the bread. That just as the Pharisees and Herod were against Jesus, that they need to be mindful that in taking a mindset that is similar to Herod and the Pharisees, they will destroy themselves. Because they will have followed after the poisonous teaching and mindset put forth by the Pharisees and Herod. And he says, do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, having ears do you not hear. And do you not remember? See, even disciples of Christ can be distracted by lesser things. See, it wasn't just the Pharisees who were distracted. It wasn't just the Pharisees 
who were off kilter. It's also Jesus' own disciples who were more focused on the physical rather than the spiritual lesson that Jesus was trying to teach. And if we aren't careful, we'll allow the things of this world and the temptations of this world to distract us from Jesus. And you've heard me say this before. What do we build our life around? Because what we build our life around is what we are most dedicated to. What we build our life around is what we worship. And the question at hand is, do we understand? Do we get the magnitude and the weight of who Jesus is? Do we understand the position of where we were and who we are in light of the cross? Do we understand and do we truly get the idea that this whole thing of who Jesus is has eternal and that to react to that flippantly sets us up not just for failure in this life, but anguish in the next. And notice what he says. He says, and do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full? Or full of broken pieces did you take up? They said in twelve, and the seven for the four thousand. How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? He's calling to them and he's saying to them, do you not understand who I am? When you compare me to the Pharisees, when you compare me to Herod, and when you calculate the situation and circumstances that we found ourselves in together, that in those moments of desperation for those people, I prevailed. Do we know? That in our darkest moments, we can recall the pain and the suffering and the temptation that we've been through and the moment in which we've had that light bulb moment, we realize after, most of the time, after we've exhausted all other options, we've understood that Jesus is the one who satisfies that pain. Jesus is the one who helps us overcome the temptation. Jesus is the one who completely and totally satisfies and gives us the sustenance spiritually to survive. The solutions to this world cannot be found in a bill that is passed, cannot be found in a senator that is elected, cannot be found in any single world leader that has lived, is living, or will live. The solution to the world, the, satisf the satisfaction that, can, that the world needs to have is that in the partaking of the blood and the flesh of Jesus Christ. And maybe one of the reasons it hasn't is because we're not convinced and we're not convicted as much as we should be. Yet we would also say that on an average weekly basis, we spend time with Jesus. That on, the, on par, most of our lives, we have seen God work in people's lives in which there is no other plausible explanation. Just like these disciples have. And sometimes the light bulb is not just dim, it's out. And we need to recall exactly who it is. We are in fellowship with. We need to recall exactly who it is. Who is Savior? We need to understand that Jesus is the satisfier because He is Savior. 
Then, in verse 27, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked the disciples a very famous yet all-important question. What or who do the people say that I am? As you've listened, as you've traveled with me, as you've been on this journey, who do the people say that I am? And they told him, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say one of the prophets. Not to, uh, not to, um, is similar to what we hear today. Who do you say that Jesus is? Well, he's a good moral teacher. Well, he's, you know, just a person of history. Oh, well, he was a decent moral guy that did a lot of good for people. That's what we hear. Some people might even say he doesn't even, he never even existed. And he asks that question to set up the next question. And he asked, but who do you say that I am? And here is the light bulb moment for at least one of them. And go figure, it's Peter. And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. You are the one who all of the Old Testament prophecies point to. You are the one that we have been looking for. You are the author of not only our spiritual satisfaction, but also our spiritual salvation. You are both satisfier and saved. And notice what that one person because he understood exactly who Jesus was and what he could provide people did with the rest of his life. It would be not too long from there that he would stand before a midst of people who cried out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And he himself, who had been redeemed from his own shortcomings, because the light bulb flickered for a second, would stand before a group of people and say, let the entire house of Israel know that this Jesus whom they have crucified is both Lord and Savior. Amen. He is both Satisfier and Savior. And those people responded because they understood what they had done. Light bulb moment. They were pierced in their heart. And they asked, Brothers, what shall we do? When was the last time we stood before people? And they were pierced because we told them that Jesus was satisfier and Savior. The reason that Peter could do that is because he was from a position of failure, a position of sin, but was reassured by Jesus that he was a saint. And that is our goal. And that is our mission. That once the light bulb clicks, and we understand that Jesus is satisfier and Savior. It is our obligation. It is our duty. Out of the relationship that we have with Jesus as satisfier, as Savior, to make sure other people have a light bulb moment. That they too are pierced, from the, pierced in the heart and ask, Sir, ma'am, what do I have to do? That can only happen if 
We're convinced. We're convicted. The problem, this is first opinions. The problem with church growth is not that the culture has become secular. The problem with church growth is that the church just doesn't care as much as it should. And the question we have to ask ourselves this evening is, do we care? Do we care enough? Is it on our minds that Jesus is the satisfier of souls and the Savior who makes sinners saints? And if that's something that is at the forefront of, their, of our mind, is at the forefront of our heart, and is the center of our actions, we will change the world. I am completely convicted and convinced that that is a fact. Amen. Do we believe it? Do we live it? Do we own it? Do we possess it? both here and here. And I hope tonight, if you're not a Christian, I hope that you understand that Jesus is Satisfier and Savior. And that He is the one that you can identify with. He is the one that you can find ultimate peace, joy, and comfort. And no longer do we have to live and do you have to live by the definitions that are forced on us by the world. That's not where you find acceptance and joy and love, but it's in Him. And because it's in Him, that allows for, in the words of Mel Gibson, as William Wallace, freedom. And as the church, we live in a world where people are enslaved and don't know it. Don't know that they need freedom. Let's focus our daily efforts in letting people know about the Satisfier who is Savior. Let's seek out light bulb moments. And if you need that tonight, if you need this time,